Good evening, Hope Reformed Baptist Church. We're looking at the story of Jephthah tonight, who will, uh, I, his name's hard to say quickly, so if uh, you forgive me, I may just call him Jeff for the remainder of tonight, but we find his story in Judges chapter 11 and onwards. Uh, it's great to meet you. If I haven't yet uh, been able to converse with you and welcome you here, then uh, consider it done right now. You're welcome. The people around you are tremendous, warm people. We love Jesus. We worship Him, and we love the Word that He has given to us in the Bible. Amen? Amen. The story of Judges is a tragic downward spiral, one that starts with what looks like an endless cycle of Forgiveness and then unrepentance and apostasy and then forgiveness and liberation and unrepentance and apostasy. But it is not an endless cycle. It is an ending, deteriorating wave. And we've come to that part of the book, really this latter half, which tells us of those stories that have uh, uh, the, the, the judges who arose but did not see the peace restored to Israel that they had known in days past. And they did not see uh, the blessings of God in revival among the people that they had seen in days past. Every round and every generation of sin, every time God gave them redeeming and restorative grace, and it was spurned and spat back in God's face with the breaking of His covenant and the worshipping of idols and other gods, every time God restrained his, uh, his mercies just that little bit more and gave Israel further and further away into their enemies' hands. The job of Israel in the time of Judges, the assignment that really looms over them as the test marker, will they uh, achieve this? Will they be faithful to what God has sent them to do? Is go into the land that Moses has started to take, that Joshua and Caleb carried on in their military feats, uh, the promised land, promised to Abraham. These are those lands they are meant to obtain by faith in God. And as long as they had faith in God, God had promised them the miraculous God who had delivered them from the superpower Egypt, split an ocean so they could walk past and then killed a giant and sent angels to help them and feed them with dust from the clouds. This miracle working God told them all they had to do was have faith and one man could race against an entire army of giants and send them running. That's all they needed was faith. And instead, they were carnal. They counted armies by number, not by which God sided with them. And therefore, they failed their task of going each tribe into their, uh, and, uh, their promised land uh, within the larger promised land. Each of them, most of them, uh, by vast the majority, failed to really even execute the fir- uh, a, a, a good portion of land clearing. And God judged them for not executing His justice upon the pagan enemies of God enough. God judged them and sent the enemy rose up the enemies who still lived around them to, uh, to weaken and destroy and punish Israel for not being faithful to God's commands and ultimately for not trusting God enough to do what he promised he would do. It is a great, great insult when we don't trust God to do what he in his word, face to face as much as is possible, promised us he will do. It is blasphemous when we just doubt him that he will be able to do what the creator of the universe told us he would do. This is Israel. It's into this situation that Jephthah is uh, uh, introduced. And we have, uh, this would be probably, as I mentioned at the beginning of this series, this would be an easier sermon series to preach if the writer of the book of Hebrews didn't do me the immense disservice of including some of these dirtbags and scumbags in the hall of faith of men and women that await us in heaven and that are currently worshipping Jesus because by their regenerate, born-again faith in this life, they served God. Do you know how hard that makes my job? I would much rather do Sunday school style, walk through the story. Everybody who did bad things, we say, don't do bad things. Everybody who does good things, we say, do good things. God loves good things. Close Bible. Oh, and Jesus. That would just be an easy three-point sermon. Don't do bad. Do good. Love Jesus. But instead, for example, Hebrews 11 tells me in verse 32, as he's just recounting the heroes of the faith, who by faith in Christ, that is the faith that Hebrews 11 is talking about, real, genuine, born-again faith. And Hebrews 11 says, in this long list of wonderful servants of God, he says, and what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, 
who through faith conquered kingdoms, we see that tonight, enforced justice, we see a little bit of that, obtained promises, kind of, stopped the mouths of lions, not in this story, quenched the power of fire, not really, escaped the edge of the sword, yes, were made strong out of weakness, yes, became mighty in war, you bet, put foreign armies to flight. That's the story, in large part, of Jephthah, these, these parts that the writer of the Hebrews just included there. Now, as we go through the story, you will see why Jephthah is such a hard character to preach and why Hebrews 11 makes it so difficult because I have to start by saying he was actually a good guy. He's a dirtbag like you and I by nature. We'll see that sneak in in the story. Nonetheless, he's, he's around Jesus right now, worshipping him. He, his, his, his badge of honour is that he chased armies of foreigners with a sword. That's what Hebrews 11 says. Put foreign armies to flight. Do you see how, see how politically incorrect that is? Their claim to religious fame in the halls of faith of heaven is that they chased foreigners with blades. All right, you're hearing, you're hearing that now that I put it in modern nomenclature? Maybe some of you are just changing your political persuasion right now. Uh, are you saying the... The Crusades were virtuous. No, we're not, we're not going there. I'm just saying, for some of these guys, this is Old Testament faith. This is what it looked like. So Jephthah is apparently in heaven laughing at preachers like me who have to preach his life story and try and make it sound like anything other than a call to Christian jihad. So anyway, here we are, Judges 11, and uh, we find that Israel is at a very low ebb. Now, our, our process going through the book of Judges is, uh, as much as we would love it, uh, go line by line through the whole, we can't, we don't have time to do that. We're, we're really taking biographical chunks, and that means some few chapters at a time. Tonight we have 11 and 12. And our questions that we've been asking is, what happened in this story? Because our bedrock assumption and uh, uh, presupposition and uh, belief is that when Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3 that all of Scripture is good for you to know because it'll help you know God's words and His ways and equip you for righteousness. We have to believe that includes judges. We don't judge it by sight. We hear it on faith. It's okay, God. Apparently, it's good for us to know this checkered, bloody, gory history of these checkered, gory saints in the Old Testament. So the Bible, all of it, including judges, it's just good to know and it's my experience that a lot of new converts, young Christians, modern evangelicals, or evangelical fish, as some uh, mockingly, mockingly say, uh, lack the kind of spying that comes from knowing our own history. And so going through Judges is good for us. We just need to know the story. What happened? Secondly, how does this play a part in the whole biblical story? Thirdly, how does it point to Jesus? And fourthly, what's some applications for us today? Because there's going to be some. So let's look at Jephthah's story. Look at chapter 11. And we'll see in verse 1. Now Jephthah, the Gileadite, that is his father was Gilead, was a, this is the introductory once upon a time. All right, the, the flowers are rolling across the, the screen. The, the, the book is opening and here's our fairy tale. Now Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior. We like him. He's just the man Israel needs. But he was the son of a whore. A prostitute. What is God's people doing with brothels in the promised land? This is bad. Gilead was the father of Jephthah. And Gilead's wife also bore him sons. So this is great. Gilead's a great guy, a real patriarch, stand-up chap. He's got lots of sons, like God told him to do. Go into the promised land. Be fruitful. Multiply. Not with the prostitutes. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, you shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman, to put it mildly. Jen then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob, and worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out and about with him. This is always the, what, what Scripture shows us. And as uh, uh, Craig Ireland, our friend and uh, brother preacher last week, so aptly showed us, this is the cycle that we see in sin. Sin is like a seed, just like righteousness is. And the seed of sin always is planted and will always bring forth more sin. Sin is like a fruit, a bitter fruit, but a fruit. A fruit that has its own reproductive seeds in its own flesh, so that it is thrown to the wayside, simply lived out in your life. Sin begets sin and grows entire uh, uh, harvests of unrighteousness. Gilead was an unrighteous man, like 
Gideon sinned at the end of his life. Gilead's sons were therefore unrighteous men. Just like Abimelech, Gideon's son, swam in the sin of his father and came out looking like it. So here we have uh, Jephthah. He is the son of a prostitute. I love that, I love that uh, just as I was reading this, I was just struck. This reminds me of George Mueller. George Mueller was a missionary, an evangelist, and an orphanage raiser who ended up feeding and housing over 10,000 orphan orphans in England uh, back in the 1800s. And he was born in Prussia out of wedlock in the 1800s. Enormous social stigma. You are cursed of God. Maybe your mum's demonic because you were born out of wedlock. Here God shows us he doesn't mind the past. He is willing to turn anybody that has faith in him into a mighty uh, uh, saint in his hands. Well, Jephthah is anything but a saint, but he does remind us of God's redeeming grace. The, the sons of Jephthah's father to the legitimate wife, base, uh, dirtbags though they are, they can do some basic maths. And when they grow up, they realize that Gilead's going to die and he's going to leave us all of his lands and apportion it equally among us. Well, the less divisions, the greater the, lot, the portions. That's basic grade one and two maths. And so, they, well, if you get rid of one of the sons, who technically doesn't really have an inheritance among us anyway because his mum's a prostitute, well, then we all get that little bit more. So there goes, blood is thicker than water. They kick him out. They send him out into the wilderness. Go and make your own life. And basically, if we were in, in Hollywood, this would kind of be the... This would be the equivalent of like a, a, a Ned Kelly, I think, in, in Australia. It's like he's, he's losing his inheritance because of bad government policy and bad uh, family ties. And so he moves out to the mountains and amasses this gang of, of, uh, of gentlemen who are just bitter against the system and hateful towards their, their fathers and the, and the lands of their fathers. And, and these guys just sort of amass around him with shotguns, 12 gauges, and large homemade armor. That's what we're looking at here. This is Jephthah. Or if you were in New York, this would be Jephthah moves out of his family household and joins the mafia and works his way up and becomes a don with plenty of capos and soldiers underneath him. He's illegal. He's an outlaw. He's violent. He's a mighty warrior, jaded against the system and his family. This is like the, out in the West. He's a, cow, he's a ranger. He's been, he's been broken off from the system and he's an outlaw. And around him is just a gang and a tribe of men on horses with pistols. And they run through town, take what they want, pillage, steal, and go back home to the mountains where they have somewhere, or maybe if we were in like the, the hills of Australia modern day, this is, this is Uncle Jeff. He's got a Harley. He's got 12 other mates who have Harleys. They uh, work on their own bikes and they, and they live in caravans out in the national bush land somewhere. You only hear of them when there's crimes being committed on small country towns. That's what this is like. He's out there, he's off the grid, he uses solar, doesn't trust the government, alfoil hat, blades, sawn off shotguns, no registrations on his vehicles. We like Uncle Jeff, don't we? I, I, I like St. Jeff in, uh, in Judges. This is his kind of uh, vibe. Few things bind disgruntled young men together more than bitter hatred for the system. And these worthless fellows, we're told in verse 3, gather around Jephthah and his magnetic anti-system charisma. Well, in him they find the father they never had. He becomes the father he never had. And he lives out in the bushes. Now look at verse 4. After a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel. One of the themes we're seeing tonight is that the sins of the father always carry down to the next generation. Why in the world? This is, this is what should shock us, but we get so familiar. We just know our biblical history and we, 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 we get conversant with it. And we forget that every time you read the word Ammonite or Ar Amorite or Jebusite or any other ite, you're supposed to shudder because they shouldn't exist. They were commanded to be destroyed, outright driven from their lands into the sea or slaughtered in bloodshed under God's wrath. How in the world is there Amorites left to war against Israel? Because the Israelites' great-great-granddaddies didn't do a good job at obeying God, and so their great-great-grandchildren are inheriting that curse. Israel from long ago failed. Israel of Jephthah's day, and it is now stuck within a bind. Jephthah, the son of a womanizer, is cast out of his family, much in the same way. 
The sins of the father returning upon the heads of the next generation. Much of what we inherit in this life is not our fault. It is also not an excuse. You just have to admit, I mean, it would be, it would be ridiculous optimism to sort of look at the world and say, you can change anything about it you don't like. Nope. You can change almost nothing. You're in control of almost nothing. I'm not, not really a, a motivational speaker here tonight. You're not a TED Talk learning how to go home and change the world. The world is as it is. It is this way because of the trillions of decisions of billions of humans that have gone before you, had probably more power than you, and occupied a larger subsection of the world being less people in previous generations. I mean, it, it, basically, the, the stage is set. You're now on the checkerboard, and the only thing you can control is not what has gone on behind you, or even what is the case right now, but what you will leave behind after your faithful life has been done. That's all you got, and that is plenty to give account for. Many people get jaded and bitter, inheriting, looking around, well, my family's a family line of this. Look at the state of the church in this country. Look at the politics in this nation. Look what happened in these wars. Look at the economy now. Thanks, boomers. And you can get bitter and jaded and complain like you're not the luckiest generation to ever exist on the planet. We need to take a check at this moment. Je Jephthah had, a, had inherited a sin-sick country in a horrible political world. The, Amorites are all, the Ammonites are all over Israel. They have inherited much sin. The real test is not what you have inherited. The real test is our own behavior and our own responses with what we've got. In dark times, what will we do ourselves? First step, stop complaining. Give thanks to God for what he has given us. Well, here is Jephthah, he's been kicked out, and now, as the Ammonites start warring against Israel, uh, Ammonites, again, even their existence says that the Israelites failed, but let me go back a little bit further into the nutty, nutty family tree of the Ammonites. Even their existence as a nation before Israel is a problem. Do you know who Ammon's father was? Lot! Who escaped sinfully sexual Sodom and Gomorrah under God's grace? Remember, this whole abusing and, 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 and uh, assuming God's grace is kind of a theme in Scripture. I hope you see that it's a proclivity of ours as well. Lot, under uh, the, the, the angels preaching, uh, found rescue and refuge away from Sodom and Gomorrah. He was not judged for their sexual sinful perversions. Him and his two daughters escaped to the mountains. His wife looked back at Sodom and said, made for good holidays, and she turned to Sodom. Salt. And then he goes up into the mountains with his two daughters. They thought basically the apocalypse had happened. There's no more human beings left on earth. God just, ra you would forgive them for thinking that, when fire just rained down in the whole visible earth. So anyway, he's the father of Ammon and of Moab. Do you know who their mums are? Lot's daughter one, Lot's daughter number two. Don't worry, he got drunk before he impregnated them. So the existence of the Ammonites and the existence of the Moabites is just another taste of very uncomfortable, disgusting to preach, history that is real and riddled with sin. Their existence as a nation is another proof that the sins of the father are delivered upon the next generation. Now Israel didn't wipe them out for their sexual, sinful, idolatrous perversion. And this generation, 300 years later of Jephthah, now they have to deal with it. So here we are, look at verse, four. Uh, look at verse 5. And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead, <laughs> you love this, the elders of Gilead, who were the men who inherited the house of Gilead? Jephthah's half-brothers. All his old brothers, send him a letter. Knock on his caravan door with a peace offering and a new, a new uh, uh, tires for his Harley. He goes, oh Jephthah, wouldn't you mind coming to defend us? We'd love to have you back. Christmas is awful lonely without you. The Ammonites made war against Israel. The elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. That's a mountainy area. And they said to Jephthah, come and be our leader. This is rich. So that we may fight against the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, if I, I had plenty of moonshine up here in the mountains. I'm pretty sure my memory serves me well enough how I got here. 
Did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me when you are now in distress? Like, where do you get off? Oh, and the front compound gates are locked and my gentlemen have surrounded you. Answer for yourselves. Verse 8, and the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, oh, that is why we've turned to you now. Gaslighting him. What, what, what are you complaining about? We're here now, aren't we? Aren't we great brothers? We've reunited. So that you may go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. You get to be a mini king. Replace our father. Wow, that is the inherit. That is rule over all of the inheritance when we wouldn't even give you a sliver before. How desperate they have become. Verse 9, Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, well, if you bring me home again to fight against the Ammonites and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your head. And the elders of Gilead said to Jeph, well, the Lord be with you, will be witness between us if we do not do as you say. Like we're being honest, we promise. Verse 11, so Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and leader over them. And Jephthah spoke all these words before the Lord at Mizpah. There we are. He's restored. What a happily ever after. Let's just close our Bibles and pray that God always brings together a beautiful, wonderful ending to every story and every family line. I'd love to end it there. The relationship between Gilead and Jephthah, or his brothers and him, is very similar to the relationship between Israel and Yahweh. Rack off. Get out of our system, get out of our politics, get out of our schools, get out of our churches. Let us preach and worship and sleep with whoever we want. Go away, God. Oh, this isn't working out. Our families are breaking down. There's illegitimate births everywhere. Drunkenness is on the rise. People are killing their children and worship to Chemosh and Molech. And now, our, now our, we have an aging population. We don't have enough people to defend our walls. Oh, we don't even have walls anymore. The enemies are in. God, what did you do? And, and they go to him as chapter 10, actually. We've skipped over a, a chunk that we'll come back to in, previ- in next weeks. But chapter 10 says it, Israel went to God and God went, what are you coming to me for? I told you what to do. You rejected it. Now you get your whoring gods. Go after them. God just refuses to help them. Jephthah is not quite that just, but the situation is very similar. We have an intentional authorial echo going on here. They come to him going to him who they have previously hated in order to ask for help because they are so treacherous, but even more desperate. And here they are. We'll look at verse 12 through 23 now. Now Jephthah, he sent messages to the king of Ammonite, uh, of the Ammonites and said, what do you have against me that you've come against me to fight against my land? I love, he's just owning this leadership thing. My people, my land, you're fighting against me. Daddy's back in town, right? That's what he's saying. He goes, Gilead's real son is in town, and I'm going to crack some heads. So he sends a messenger. Why are you fighting against me, O king of Ammon? And the Ammonites respond to Jephthah. Look at verse 13. Because Israel, on coming up from Egypt, right, this sounds, this is Marxist revisionist history. Because we had land, you moved in, you took our land, we want it back. And everyone goes, well, they sound like the victim, so they should be right. Give them their stuff back. And out of nowhere, this bush hick Uncle Jeff just explodes on a historically accurate, political uh, uh, science-involved lecture. (laughs) This is surprising to me. I would love to be here as, as, uh, as Uncle Hick from the bush just schools these kings on political history. It's amazing. Look what happens. Verse 15, thus says Jephthah. Now, this is going to go until verse uh, 28. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But it's hilariously articulate. Israel did not take away the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites. But when they came up from Egypt, Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea and then to Kadesh. You'll find that on your map. Israel then sent messengers to the king of Edom saying, please let us pass through your land. Like he's quoting kings from 300 years ago and referring to archived messages between political uh, advisors. But the king of Edom would not listen. And then they also sent the king of Moab, but he would not consent. So Israel remained at Kadesh. Again, refer to Appendix A. I've got that on the back of your slips there. That's the map. Then they journeyed through the wilderness and went around the land of Edom and the land of Moab and arrived on the east side of the land of Moab, camped on the other side of 
Arnon. But they did not enter the territory of Marab, for the, uh, uh, for the Arnon was the boundary of Moab. Israel then sent messengers to Sihon. He's got the names accurate. Where is this bushick getting his reading from? This is like, this is Uncle Jeff. He goes out to the bushes and he has nothing to do but read old military archives. I like this guy. He's just schooling them on history. Israel then sent messages to Sihon, king of the Amorites, king of Heshbon, and Israel said to him, please let us pass through your land to our country. But Sihon did not trust Israel to pass through his territory, a measly 50-kilometer strip anyway. So Sihon gathered all his people together and camped at Jahaz and fought with his... He just picked a fight with our peaceful, nomadic, moving caravan. So he got what was coming, verse 21. And the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. So Israel took possession, right? Here's his history, very unwoke. We beat you in a war. It's our land. <laughs> it's biblical. Here's the other correction. The Ammonites are nowhere to be mentioned here. This is the Amorites we beat who picked a war with us. We fought with the Moabites who were picking a fight with us. Where are the Amorites? You're just trying to get in on the victim party here. Did you misread your R's and your, R's and your N's? You read Amorite and thought that was the Ammonites? Are you aware that you're different nations? Here he's just schooling them and he even throws in some sass and some good sarcasm like any good politician uh, uh, negotiating war. Verse 23, he says, So the Lord, the God of Israel, dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel. And are you to take possession of them? Big boy Ammon, you're going to come over here with your inbred genes and take the battle from Yahweh? Dad, that's going to go well. Look what he says in verse 24. Will you not possess what Chemosh, your God, gives to you? <laughs> Chemosh gave them no land. He's looking around over his shoulder going, where's, where's your God at? I feel like, I feel like he, might, he should be here, don't you think? Well, where's all the land that he promised to you and then delivered to you in miraculous warfare? What's, what's that land again? Oh, None. Your land keeps shrinking and, and then growing as tribes push in and, and buttress your land. Oh, you're not divinely ordained. That's, that's cute. It must be hard, but that's cute. Yeah, I represent Israel. I'm here speaking for Yahweh. Back down. Is this conversation going the way you thought it would go, O king of the Ammonites? Verse 24. Will you not possess what Chemosh, your God, gives to you? And all that the Lord, our God, has dispossessed before us, we will possess. Thank you very much. Verse 25. Now, are you any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Ripping out history again. Going, he didn't even try and fight us when his prophet refused to curse us. But you're better than him, right? The famous King Balak. You're more glorious than him. You get to pick a fight with God when he wouldn't even bother. Schooling him with history. And then down in verse uh, 26. While Israel lived in Heshbon and in its villages and in Aoriah and its villages and in all the cities that are on the banks of the Anon, 300 years, did you not deliver them within that time? Did you not rescue your lands from us, colonizers? For 300 years, you've said nothing and now all of a sudden you need to take back the land? He's just calling the garbage from the politicians. Verse 27, I therefore have not sinned against you. And you, do me no, and you do me wrong by making war on me. Here's his monotheistic declaration of faith in God's word and his promises. The Lord Yahweh, the judge, I'm not the judge, I'm a judge. The judge will decide this day between the people of Israel and the people of Ammon. But the king of the Ammonites did not let the facts get in the way of a good land grab. See, he's a good politician here. They had resources they wanted. They didn't let uh, people's rights and freedoms and, and duty to live peacefully get in the way of a good political warfare. So he picked a fight. He did not listen to the words of Jeff that he sent to him. This is a mate. Cicero once said, he was a, he was a sort of a Greek philosophy inheriting Roman uh, uh, senator. And, and uh, uh, a powerful man in the Republic. And he said, to be ignorant of what has happened before your birth is to remain forever a child. It cannot emphasize enough. Now, Christian speaking, we believe in providence. All history is God's history. Know the works of the Lord. Read your history. If, we can just, if that doesn't motivate you, it's great for schooling people who have no clue what they're talking about if you just know your history a little bit. <laughs> right? 
Cicero, like Jephthah, was taking a stand against Mark Antony and Julius Caesar for their trying to turn the People's Republic into an empire, into a a, a uh, tyrannically-led, emperor-led empire. And for that, he got killed. His hands and his head chopped off and put on display in Rome to show what happens to those who stand up against tyrants. That's not how it goes for Jephthah. But he agrees. To be ignorant of what happened before you were born is to remain forever a child. So look at verse 29. And this is the tragic part of an otherwise glorious story. Even starts well. Then the spirit of Yahweh was upon Jephthah for his boldness and for his faith in God's promises. It was upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on to Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he passed on to the Ammonites, right? He's he's taking the fight to the bad guys. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will give me the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out of the doors at my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer him up a burnt offering. Hang on. (laughs) Jephthah, weren't you just reciting verbatim chapters and chapters of Israel's history and their law code? Aren't you aware that the Lord, the judge, will decide? And you need no vow to convince God to fulfill his promises other than mere faith in his promises. Superstition has overcome Jephthah's faith. You never need to twist God's arm with silly man-made vows in order to convince God it's a good idea to not be a liar. He promised it. He doesn't break his promises. He keeps his covenant promises to a thousand generations. And here's Jephthah going, Lord, I'll motivate you. I'll kill anyone at home that welcomes me with glee probably a slave, maybe one of his, his little bikey uh, mechanics, his apprentices, one of the, one of the low so, uh, soldiers in his whole, his whole uh, militia that he's got in the bush. Whoever comes out, I'm going to crush, I'm going to burn him and I'll offer him to you, Lord. God didn't need this convincing. The spirit of the Lord was already with Jephthah. He's gone and muddied the entire waters by adding his own stupid, man-made, religious, personal, invented vow. That is made rashly and illegally. You cannot kill humans as a sacrifice to God. Nonetheless, the victory gets a mere sentence and the tragedy continues. Look at verse 32. So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. And he struck them from Aor in its neighborhood of Minith, 20 cities as far as Abel Karamim, with a great blow. So the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. A couple of sentences, a couple of verses, sandwiched in between tragic idiocy where superstition overtook faith. So it goes on. Then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah, and behold, his daughter did what women were supposed to do when the daddies came home holding enemies' heads and lots of gold and jewelry. She came out. She praised her dad for his valor for his wonderful faith in God's promises. She praised God for his provisions and his protection and his making good on his covenant promises. His daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dancers. This poor girl, she was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and had the gall to say, oh, alas, my daughter. He starts blaming her. The sins of the father include blaming the children for inheriting the sins of the father. Look at you, about to be killed. Stupid girl, should have stayed inside. Should have been in the kitchen, not celebrating God's glory. No, this is your sin, Jephthah. She's doing all good. She's doing the right thing. This is your rash vow and your idiotic leadership. Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. No one did that but him and his fathers. This is part of the the failure and the cowardice of sinning fathers is that they continually blame the coming generation instead of taking responsibility for the sin of themselves, their house, and their fathers. 
You have brought me very low. You did this. You have become the cause of great trouble for me. For have I not opened my mouth to the Lord? And I cannot take back my vow. You bet you can, Jephthah. It's an illegal vow that God hates. It's what the scripture warns against a rash vow. Sometimes we will vow things in, in a moment of zest, in zeal, in, in anger, in frustration, or, or, in, or in excitement. Or you will just blurt something out and promise it to God, and you're supposed to fulfill it. You'll be, you'll be rebuked by God for making such a silly vow. But sometimes the punishment for such sin is having to fulfill your silly vow. This is not one of those vows. This is one of those vows he should have confessed his idiocy, his, his, his rash speech, his illegal affections, his, his bloodthirstiness that was pointed towards his household instead of merely his enemies. All of these, he should have just confessed it. He should have got together all of the men, and men love doing this. He should have called all the men that he made this rash, drunken vow in front of probably, brought them all together, and like every man loves to do, say, gentlemen, I was wrong. I was deeply wrong. I spoke in my passion and in my, my anger, and I should have more, been more gentle and lowly. I apologize. I, I confess my sin. I repent to you. Please forgive. Don't men just love, especially leading men, especially testosterone-pumped warrior men? Don't, 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 aren't men just known for this? But instead, like Herod at his party in the book of Mark, where he made a rash vow to his half-naked stepdaughter. He said, I'll give you anything you want. You're looking pretty. She said, well, kill John the Baptist, who you've been protecting in prison. And he could have said, no. No, uh, Proverbs 31 says that it is the foolish kings who give their strength to women, and they, through drink, weaken them and lead them into unrighteous rule. I'm not going to do that. Instead, he says, well, look at all my party guests. They're here for a show. I need to not go back on my word. Jephthah is similar. Some men hold so fast to their internally held idiotic vows. You know, I made a promise to myself when I was 18. Yeah, 18? That, that an age you want to bind yourself to eternal promises, Bon? You know, look, I've got a tattoo right here when I was 16 and a half in a jail cell. And it reminds me that, Maybe, maybe 16 and a half you shouldn't be life coach for 50-year-old you. Just saying. Just, just a thought. Maybe you want to think about that for a while in your next prison sentence. Or men in, men in business. Like a, I made a, a vow to my dad at his grave that if I ever make a million dollars, dot, dot, dot. Yet, yeah, do you think maybe making life-changing promises in the zeal and in the emotion of a funeral could be silly? Men just, men just love writing their own hero story. Jephthah's no different. Gentlemen, we're no different. He wants to be special. He wants to be the exception. He wants to be wild. He wants to be the hero. So he makes his own hero story and his daughter is going to suffer under the sins of her father. At least for all of Gilead's womanizing and prostitute sleeping and family home wrecking, at least Gilead never killed Jephthah. And Jephthah wouldn't see it this way. He's, you're all, bitter young men are always better than their, than their useless fathers. You know, those generations, they got us into war. Oh, those generations, they, you know, but it's just so weird being perfect and having nothing to apologize for. It's, it's weird, but here I am with the internet archiving all of my foolishness, right? Gilead was better than him because he didn't kill his child. And he at least carried on his name. I mean, if we can say anything about Gilead, he'd had, he had more than one kid that he didn't kill. So a better Israelite than Jephthah in practice. And we might say in our modern psychology, well, can't we spare some grace for Jephthah? Now, Jephthah in heaven wants us to give his sin no grace. Jesus did that already. But the law condemns our sin very, 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 very bluntly. So let's do that. Jephthah... Uh, people would want to say, well, well, he was a result of a troubled home. And we know the effects of fatherlessness and a broken home and, and the sort of things that, I mean, if his mother was that kind of uh, employee, then, then of course she would have had uh, very little time to nurture him at home. He, he probably had trauma and he had family wounds and the masculine mother wound and, uh, and maybe other things we could diagnose as well. He, isn't he really just the victim of all of the decisions of his parents? Yeah. Yeah, that's called parenting. Everybody is just the result of the decisions of their parents. Everybody. You are, I mean, you are more than this. But you're only a little bit more of the result of every single guy 
that impregnated every single woman in your line. You're not a, you're not a main story in the wonderful, wonderful next Disney movie. You and I are here. 90% of what you've inherited in your genes, your personality and your inclinations and your strengths and your shape and your color, all of that. It's just, and the culture created around us is just the inheritance of sinners who went, before, there's more than that, there's some good too, but we're, we're very little more than that. I, I don't see how that uh, biblical truth that God visits the sins of the Father upon the generations who join them in sin, I don't see how that somehow, with modern psychology, flips on its head the fact that we are also all liable for all of the ways we join our parents in their sins. Like, yeah, you're the result of your parents. Jephthah was the result of his upbringing. And he's guilty of murdering his child. Don't start, don't start defending his choice to abort a teenager because he had a troubled childhood. We don't, have, we don't get to choose the life, the family, the household, the culture, the nation, the economy that we inherit. We just get to choose what we do with it. And faithlessness is never excused by fathers or previous generation's sins, is it? So here we are. Jephthah is sinning just like his parents sinned, but worse. And now it's her turn. Born into a mountain gang, far from the gathering of the Israelites, away from the means of grace and the preaching of the word and the worship of God's people. Her father makes a silly rash vow surrounded by a bunch of testosterone-induced men and she dies as a human sacrifice. Murdered by her father and God rejects her life as a sacrifice. God doesn't take human sacrifices. A wasted, worthless sacrifice. A life snuffed out for no redeemable purpose except for teaching us that rash vows are idiotic and that the sins of the fathers and the mothers, previous generations, must not be repeated. Don't be bitter. Be repentant. He blames her. He kills her. So many people look at this, and, and a, a, lot, a lot of commentators, I think the most, the guys with the most doctorates, they try and argue, well, he, probably he didn't kill her. It probably means that he devoted her to the temple. Right? Probably. Because God doesn't receive, you know, it's illegal in Israel to make human sacrifices. Right? And in Israel, it's just at the peak of their law-abiding, you know, standards right now. Yeah. Sorry, who was his mother again? Oh, that's right. A prostitute. Did you not remember from verse 1? Um, a, little bit of, a little bit of give and take here would be good. Not usually the word you want to yell out from the pew, I understand. Uh, yeah, I think maybe, this is my submission, I think maybe Israel is in a state of horrible sin. I read that in one of the verses. And that God has given them over to all kinds of sins and horrible uh, abuses of his law. And I think that Jephthah is maybe, though a saint, though he has faith, not Jesus. So maybe he broke the law. <laughs> right? he, he read the military history of Israel. He loved those pages. He skipped the law. He did not care about how to live. He loved who Moses killed. That, that's a part of the Torah that he liked to read. So yeah, I think it's most likely that he broke the law. We should lean on that interpretation. Whichever one broke the most laws, the Israelites probably did that. Nonetheless, here he is, and, and uh, she said, well, give me two months, Father, to mourn my virginity. And off she went to the mountains, and back she came in verse 40. Um, verse 39, he did as he had vowed. He killed her, a young, childless end of his family line. He would not pass on his sins. His sins killed his family line. Chapter 12, we can look at this briefly because it's a very simple story. The men of Ephraim, now they are, they are to the west of the Jordan River. Ephra, uh, 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 the guys on the, on the east, um, Gilead, that's who, who, who uh, Jephthah has been leading. Just over the river to the west is Ephraim. And this is their complaints department getting in contact with Jephthah. He says, why did you cross over to fight the Ammonites and did not call us to go out with you? Now we're going to burn your house on top of you. <laughs> That escalated rapidly. And Jephthah said to them, right, the political outsider doesn't do pol politics. He does not care for their games. He goes, I sent you a letter. I asked for your help. You saw that it was written by Jephthah, who you didn't recognize, and you threw it in the bin. Not my fault. And then in verse 4, there was some exchange of racial slurs, saying, you know, you're on the land in between two other nations. Ha, ha, ha. And back and forth it went. And then civil war breaks out among the Israelites. 
God has just brought them victory from their enemies and now there's civil war because one politician wanted his name on the plaque. I wanted to be with you when we won. Let's kill more of our sons so that I get some glory. The sins of the father, the ruling political father, now being thrust down onto the sons. Go out, fight in a useless, pointless war. End more family lines. Shed more blood. Disgrace God's name. Kill your cousins because I wasn't invited to the after party. The sins of the fathers pouring down red hot gallons and gallons upon the sons. Verse, um, it does get funny though. In verse five, after the Gileadites killed the Ephraimites, they won battle, they killed many of them, and then they stood on the river, which was the border between the two states. And any of the Ephraimites who were trying to, after losing, run back home to their towns, everybody was stopped on the Jordan River. They told, where are you from? Now, if any of these... you know, sly little Ephraimites had tried to say, oh, I'm a Gadite. Oh, no, I'm from, I'm from Reuben. I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm, from the, uh, I'm from up north. I'm just sort of going over here on a holiday. That's why I'm coming through. Uh, the Gileadites had devised a funny, kind of racist, very funny, plan. They go, all right, pronounce this word. <laughs> it's kind of like after, if, if, if you could imagine, it is a distant memory now. If the Wallabies ever beat the All Blacks for a grand final, and then into the, uh, the after party where the trophy's on display, uh, some Kiwis tried to sneak in and they t- you know, they'd taken their black jumper off and they tried to sneak in and the guys on security goes, who, 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 which down under country are you actually part of? He goes, oh, I'm Aussie. You go, yeah. Say on the pitch. Oh, oh. The footy was played on the pitch. Boom. You've outed yourself. <laughs> That's what this is. There's actually another historical precedent of this when the Sicilians, right, Mediterranean, Italians, Sicilians, when they were overrun by French uh, rulers and monarchs in the 1200s, uh, the, the Sicilian serpents, uh, the, was it the vipers or the serpents? Uh, the Sicilian uh, uh, something. The Sicilian vespers, that's what they were. The Sicilian vespers, they overthrew in a revolution the French, and then when all the French were trying to pretend they were Italian and Sicilian to escape for their life, they held them at sword point and said, say the word chickpea which in Sicilian was Sicily, but, but all of the French would sort of stuff up the pronunciation and have their heads chopped off their body. <laughs> so, nonetheless, back to the story. Uh, they couldn't say it, these poor young men. Now, how bad do you feel for the Gileadite, the guy on their team who just, you know, clopped a javelin to the jaw and is mispronouncing things today? <laughs> he can't say his S is right, so he gets killed. They said, say Shibboleth. But the Ephraimites would say, Sibolet and get killed right there in the water. Which is very, very funny until you look at the last number of verse 6. At that time, 42,000 brothers and cousins, brother in laws and sister in laws, husbands, right? Of the Ephraimites fell. 42,000 blood relatives of the Gileadites. That, that's almost as many as we, that's two thirds of how many we lost in, a, in world war from the Anzacs. We lost 60,000 in a four-year war. They killed two-thirds of that on a day. The sins of the fathers, the political warring factions who just want glory out of their peoples are killing their own sons and their people. Now, these sons die much like Jephthah's son, um, Jephthah's daughter died, much like much of Israel died because of the sins of the fathers and previous generations were not repented of. They were joined by a bitter generation who didn't know how to have faith. Here's our application if we can find some out of this. We've said it and I'll repeat it. It's not for us to determine what cards we are dealt by the sovereign God. It is only up to us what we do with them. And our response must always be faith, not superstition. Faith. Do you know how many people believe that the church in Australia will see a revival because a confused, geographically wrong Spanish Catholic said, we should call this, under the authority of the Pope, the Southland of the Holy Spirit. And he was on the wrong island. Superstition. You need some Spanish Catholics mispronounced 
uh, a statement over Australia to take uh, a faith that God can send revival in our country? How about we read his word? That all nations belong to him and he saves when and how he wants in response to the preaching of the word. How about that? How about faith, not superstition? I could tell you story after story about how rich this church could be. (laughs) Men who have promised, if God helps me quit porn or stop seeing my girlfriend or stop gambling, I'm going to give the church all of my my savings. I wanted to push them on that. I wanted so bad. But I told them, you're superstitious. God doesn't need your money. God doesn't need 50% of what you said. God doesn't need you to sell your Mercedes to help you quit porn. He's given you what you needed to quit porn. It's called Jesus. He died for your porn. It's called the Holy Spirit. He can kill your porn. It's called the Bible. Read it. Faith. No superstition. Uh, sometimes uh, take a, a female example. I've been told multiple times, you know, I've told God, I've prayed to him, I've laid out my fleece, and I've told if he finds me a husband, I'm going to raise my child to be a pastor and give 20% of my income. Well, how about you just be generous? Raise your kid to the best of your ability anyway and pray for a husband and wait. Superstition? We, we, we get so amped up like Jephthah on this special promise we made God, which I'm sure like this cute carrot, he's going to chase after. And I'll lure him into my trap of blessing me. No superstition. No, no need to make unrighteous and unholy uh, allies with worldly tactics, politicians or otherwise, in order to see God's good graces blast through in the Great Commission and see people saved. So... It's not ours to decide what world we inherit. It's ours to have faith, be thankful. And here's the second thing. If we're killing superstition, we must also leave behind bitterness. Bitterness is acidic to faith. It creates pessimistic, they call it these days, black-pilled generations. Where it's kind of like they believe everything's gone. The, the, the lizard people control the, 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 the government, or if not that. Everything's done. The economy's going down. The West is going to crumble. Everyone's going to die. Don't buy land. Don't go to church. Everything's go- Don't have kids. It's not worth it. The political apocalypse is coming. Black pill. Bitterness. Has God not done mightier things in darker generations and days? Has he not given us much to hope in and have faith in? Not in the world, in the word. Reject bitterness, reject suspicion, embrace faith and follow it up with some good old-fashioned faithfulness. How does this point us to Jesus? I love that as I read Jephthah's story, I couldn't help but be reminded of the boy Jesus. When Jesus visits town, right, the the upcountry northern hick, that's that's Jesus' family. He's a poor, can anything good come out of uh, Nazareth, right? That was was what they thought of Jesus. Really, really, the Savior's going to come from 4300, right? That's uh, that's my uh, my hometown, Ipswich. Uh, Really, this is what's going to save Jesus from Hicksville. And this 12-year-old boy, homeschool, (laughs) comes into temple, and all these rabbis overhear him speak and probably go to correct him because he's speaking out of turn and he just politely schools them ridiculously on the scriptures. I mean, (laughs) this is funny. Let's just reassemble some of these notes and come back to the boy and tell him what we think. And he he just graciously answers them so that they just become astounded. Who is this? Who is this country homeschooled kid? Why is he schooling us in our own scriptures? This is, this is Jesus, the much better Jephthah. Just, just given the history of redemption in sermon form to people who thought they could tell him what's up. But of course, he's much better than simply a teacher. He brings unity to God's people. He ransoms people from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation, rather than splitting even families against each other, like, like male leaders often do, like sinful human leaders do. Splitting the tribes of Ephraim and Gilead against one another, families warring. No, Jesus turns the Father's heart back to the sons and the sons back to the Father. Where the curse brings God's judgment from one generation to the third and the fourth, the faithfulness that Jesus, the grace that Jesus pours out in the new covenant blesses to the thousandth generation. But even more than all of this, Jesus is like Jephthah, foreshadowed in this story because he is the rejected one who becomes the saviour. As 
the Psalms prophesied, and as Peter and Jesus and Paul preach on this verse, they say, the stone that the builders considered unworthy of use didn't even bother chiseling it anymore, simply threw it out of the scrap heap, that stone has become the cornerstone. And where they threw it became the foundation of eternal life and the eternal city that God is building. There they met Jesus, rabbi from Hicksville, a a retired carpenter, telling us what to believe about our scriptures. They rejected Jesus, his own brothers, his own cousins, his own countrymen. They took him, they brutalized him, they handed him over to the Gentiles to be scourged and crucified. They tossed him outside of Jerusalem, and where that rejected stone landed was Calvary. And on Calvary, God built the eternal city of everlasting life for any who believe in him. The cross of Jesus became the scorn of rejection by man and the place of God's favor, his blessing and eternal life for every generation from every tribe, tongue and nation. The builders rejected Jesus. The brothers threw him out, but God chose him to be savior. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, receive this gift of the Holy Spirit, for this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Save yourselves from this crooked generation. This is the answer to every generational, uh, I don't want to sound superstitious, but curse. Every handed down pattern of sin and every result of sin that is just dumped out onto each coming generation, here's the result. Save yourself from this crooked generation. Save yourself from your pagan family line. Save yourself from your gambling family line, your broken family family line. Save yourself from it. Embrace Jesus Christ, rejected but exalted Savior. He alone breaks these chains. He alone establishes godliness for further generations. He alone is the Savior of every generation, of every person, of every family, of every son and daughter. This is Jesus. Repent and believe in him. Father God, we thank you so much for the promises in Jesus Christ with far, which far outshine every redemption, every act of deliverance, every promise that you made in Old Testament times that pertains to a temporary time. We thank you for those words of Jephthah, that the Lord, Yahweh, is the judge. We thank you for the words of Peter, that the Lord, Yahweh, is the Savior. And for this promise being not only to Peter's generation, in their crooked generation, but to ours and everyone since and everyone that will ever rise up on this crooked, filthy planet. In Jesus Christ, we may all find redemption, salvation, and transformation for us and for every child that comes from us and every generation to follow. Till Jesus comes back, please keep on saving souls through your word in the gospel. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all his people said...